Welcome, everybody, to another episode of When Fear Reigns. I'm really glad you chose to listen in on our conversation today. It's going to be a doozy. I'm looking forward to getting up to our eyeballs in this stuff. For a lot of people, a lot of Christians, politics isn't all that interesting. Uh, you maybe see it only as a land of division. That's fair. And we're going to try, we're not going to try and convince anybody uh, to vote one way or another. You'll not hear an endorsement from this podcast, but whether you love or hate politics, it does have an impact on you and how you're able to live out your faith. We're seeing that very clearly in this COVID time. Whether it's major stuff like stay-at-home orders or things more in the background like the Association of Christians with the Christian Right. We'll be walking that road here today. So I hope you stick with us and tune and keep tuning in. John, before we get started, I got to ask you, how are you doing in this COVID quarantine? And probably the more important question, after reading everything there is out there, where do you stand on the Packers drafting quarterback Jordan Love in the first round? Well, I'm not going to pretend to know more than the, the people who were in the draft room or at least on the draft phone. But I think you always need to look ahead in your fu- for your future. And I would think certainly Aaron Rodgers with the amount, amount of money we paid him as well as uh, uh, he's got four years. He says he wants to continue to play at least here. I would say that was probably a pretty good idea. And I would question if he was threatened by another guy here. What, you know, why, why be threatened? Maybe you yeah. said as a little impetus to even play better. But it, the Packer is an organization, and it, as well as it's a business. And so what happens, God forbid, in a certain, right? God forbid that uh, Aaron Rodgers gets hurt again, right? He gets hit, knee gets taken out, whatever it is. Well, we're still a business, and you need someone to take his place. And so they're looking for someone who down the road will take his place. And right now, hopefully can go ahead and be trained by him. The same, the same benefits that Aaron really had behind Brett Favre. So it's not that it's a game, but it's also a business. But of course, you know, in Green Bay, it's a religion, right? Oh my goodness. Yeah. I have never, I've never lived in an NFL city, Um, but it is, it is incredible to me, the, the weight, the gravity of the Packers on this town, everything that goes on in it, Um, which, you know, the whole idea of, I mean, what you're talking about is succession, right? Uh, The young quarterback being trained by the one transition period eventually that older one be an interesting podcast for us to talk about transitions in the church because we've talked about it at st mark ministries you've talked sure, about it sure um, and it's definitely a big issue facing churches um uh, around the u.s i think it's a, a major thing is boomers um and are you an exer or a boomer john i forget i'm right on the, i'm on the fence there i i would say that some would say i'm i'm the last i'm just an exer but most people would say i'm in the last year or two of boomerism right. You know, and it's one of, no- as you just said, it's one of our core, it's one of the St. Mark core values that you replace yourself. And that's why you know yeah. everyone on staff has someone who can do their job in the event that they can't, or that yeah. they retire, or that they get called to another ministry. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But that's a different podcast for a different time. Now yeah. I want to talk about um, this Christian, this whole idea of is the Christian right right? Uh, we I hear this narrative at least all the time in public discourse. Uh, that the evangelical Christians are part of a voting block called the Christian right. In other words, there's a, kind of this sentiment, and I think among many Christians too, that if you're a real Christian, you vote Republican. What are your thoughts on that? Um, first of all, yeah, I don't see that in the Bible, you know, so you can have a little issue with that. I'm sure they had their whole uh, people were picking. I want, I'm with the Sadducees or the Essenes or what, whoever you want to say back in their day. But listen, what is a Republican? What is a Democrat? What is an independent today? What's a, a constitutional conservative? I mean, you've got, they're all over the place. So when people go, well, if you're a Christian, you'll vote this way, uh, that would be legalism, I would say. And it's a dangerous precedent to set because, uh, you know, Scripture doesn't, and so you shouldn't. Let's put it that way. I'm glad you vote. I'm glad you're active in your government, one way or another, local, state, federal. But um, you can't go around labeling people and telling them, if you don't vote this certain way, you're obviously sinning. Now, we can talk about you don't want to support things that God clearly says is sin, if you, you know. If you can help it, certainly. I mean, you got to pay your taxes, and the government doesn't always use your tax money wisely or in a God-pleasing way. 
but certainly exercise your vote. And I think, I mean, I, I think what you're getting on there is, is part of the nuance that I want to dig into today. Because uh, it, it does seem like um, there's no, at, at least in, I think, in, I, I find this in my generation, people are, are feeling like there's no perfect fit. So if you're a Christian, you don't, you don't perfectly fit in any of those pigeonholes. You kind of, you, you see issues and challenges, you see opportunities, but can you just walk through, let's st- take a step back. What are some of the priorities that come out of the Christian worldview that then lead to a political, I don't know what you want to say, political engagement or political action, whether it's in your vote or campaigning for somebody or running for office or whatever. What are some of those core foundational pieces, principles that we take into a voting booth? Well, I think first and foremost for many of us would be the whole right to life. We we believe life is sacred from the moment of conception because God's word tells us that and uh, tells us that uh, we don't have the inherent right to go ahead and take life in a willy-nilly fashion. So I think we're certainly, the whole idea that we think life is precious, all life, especially the life that begins nine months in the womb, we would say that. You and I would both say, it's something that we don't see a lot today, is personal responsibility, right? We don't see that mm-hmm. sometimes. People want well, I'm not responsible. It was my parents' fault, or I didn't get enough hugs when I was a child, or the teacher didn't explain it in a clear fashion, at least not for me, or so on. And and that you see, that plays itself out in so many ways. But we as as Christians would say, listen, we have personal responsibility. God's going to hold us responsible for our personal actions and choices. So I think that's one big one. And as you've mentioned before too, you know, and you see it especially heightened now care for. Uh, creation. I got to tell you, when I was a kid in California, there was that big, this is back in the 60s and 70s, there was that big um, commercial with a Native American chief, right? A, an Indian. He was crying. You see a tear roll down his cheek and he says, when, when you see people polluting. And that was a big mm-hmm. campaign. And yet I think it should be for that. I think Christians should be for making sure we take care of our environment. Now, I think sometimes that becomes uh, a religion for many people. And there is some, I think, some good argumentation on both sides of uh, how much can we really change. That doesn't mean we don't take care of the earth. The one thing I will tell people is, yeah, there's climate change, and it's due to human beings. Now, to what degree, I don't know. But from the biblical standpoint, ever since human beings brought sin into the world, the climate has changed. It's getting worse. right? It's getting worse. So I certainly agree you want to do everything you can to help. Um, take care of the earth just don't worship it yeah yeah i think about you know some other you know we want our especially elected officials to um you know be accountable uh, be responsible Uh, god has given to each of us you know he's given me a family budget um, to steward uh, income and expenses uh, the same kind of accountability in the government Um, i have I, as a Christian, have a priority, have a command from God, especially to love the vulnerable and the broken and the downtrodden. Um, Jesus yep. himself says, or you'll always always have with you. And not as a way to say, don't take care of them. They're always going to be around. But y- yes, after I'm gone, that's a that's going to be a priority. The early Christian church really took care of widows and sick and orphans. Um, you know, there's some letters circulating now today that were written 500 years ago, 1,000, 1,500 years ago, among Christians talking about the pandem- pandemics of their time. And kind of staying, some who are, who feel compelled to do that stay in place and help those who are who are needy, who are injured, who are ill, uh, who don't, who have been abandoned by everybody else. Um, take care of them. I see all the time in scriptures taking care of, especially in the Old Testament, taking care of um, yes. the outsider, the one who's not an Israelite, the one who is a foreigner in your in your cities, in your villages, in your towns. Um, you know, caring for them yep. because you know what it's like to be a stranger. Um, yeah, you look, you look back on, yeah, you look back on history, and it's it's the Christians who really founded the hospitals and the orphanages, right. Right. And, and cared for the the lepers, right? Uh, mm-hmm. All of that when the, the the social outcasts, and mm-hmm. you see that in a certain sense now as well. I mean, I I see a lot of food pantries, Christian food pantries, uh, yeah. and uh, other communities, and I don't see so many other, I would say, um, faith traditions running mm-hmm. food pantries or hospitals, so to speak. So I think, yeah, it's always been a chance for us to share our faith 
and live our faith because as we've often said, a lot of people will tell you, don't tell me what a friend I have in Jesus until I know what a friend I have in you. Yeah, yeah. So there are a lot of, I mean, when it comes to the Christian worldview, I, I come preloaded with some, some principles. Um, and I, I think we're going to talk a little bit about how to make sure that the principles that come from my faith uh, inform my politics and not the other way around. Because I, I think a lot right. of Christians... You know, what, to, one, of the things we, what, one of the things, Ben, we bring in right now, too, and it's especially highlighted um, with, I would say, your generation and the Gen Z is Christian comes into this world believing there is absolute truth. There mm -hmm. is right and wrong. And that does impact not only your politics, but how you handle God's gift of sexuality, how you handle, like you said before, your money and, and everything else. And so that is that is markedly different today. Yeah, yeah. That, and that'll be, you know, that, that idea that there is truth. There are things that are verifiable, even if you can't see them under a microscope. There's empiricism. Uh, th there's a difference between empiricism and this this idea of of objective truth, and I think we've lost a little bit of that. Certainly, as we've you know, some people call it the post postmodern world. Um, we've kind of abandoned the idea that there is truth. Um, but I I really appreciate Ravi Zacharias is a great resource on this. He talks about the the autonomy, heteronomy, and theonomy. I don't know if you've ever heard him talk yeah. about that, but yes, theonomy yeah. usually talk about idea. that when it comes to. Uh, uh, sexuality yeah yep and i think it applies to a lot of places because i think we've moved from theonomy which is law given by god theo god namas is the law right. uh, law given by god an objective law objective uh, morality or right and wrong truth uh, to a uh, heteronomy we move from that to heteronomy other people telling us hetero is other and namas is law again other people telling us so me telling you you telling me what's right and wrong the government telling us what's right or wrong and then to an autonomous, which is a auto, auto is self, uh, self-given law. But as soon as I have a self-given law, I, I am a truth unto myself. I now become the other telling you, you have to follow my law. Yeah. But you believe what, your autonomy is not right. I, you have to follow mine. Right, right. And, and once when I have conversations with people, once they use the, uh, the descriptor, well, my truth says, then we have no mm -hmm. truth. Right. You, you right. no longer have any truth. My truth, your truth. Once you once you use those descriptors, it's done. You have no truth. Absolutely. Yeah. And a lot of and people think, say, "Yeah, go ahead." Well, I just think you know. I look at the political sphere now, and I think we're reaping the benefits of decades, at least a generation, of eroding that truth. Um, everybody throws around the label of fake news. You know, everybody throws around um, you know, f facts and figures that are twisted to their own, and and they can culturally speaking, wash their hands and say, hey, that's my truth. You can't tell me my truth is wrong. Um, and it, it's led to all kinds of weird, warped realities in our political sphere. I know, John, I wanted to ask you about this. I know that my Facebook feed is lit up with Christians who are crazy active in the political arenas on both sides, left and right. Can you help someone navigate the social media realm who is interested and concerned about politics? And so they want to post about it, but they are first in the kingdom of God. In other words, how do you, how do you engage in political discourse while maintaining your Christian credibility? Because your ultimate goal is not to win the White House or win the Senate, whatever. It's to carry out the kingdom of God into the lives of others. And so it's your primary goal is to be a witness. Sometimes those can be at odds with each other. Can you help us kind of navigate those waters? Well, something I try to do as a political junkie, as you know, um, yeah. you try to make sure you keep your discussion. If you're going to enter the fray and understand, you better not be a person with thin skin because you're going to get pummeled. Uh, yeah. Once you enter into the fray of politics online, on any platform you want to choose, uh, I always recommend that people stay on the person's position or maybe the law that's being discussed. Stay away from ad hominem attacks, and that's it's easy to do, and I've been guilty of it, and others have been guilty of it. What you want to do is make sure you stay and say, okay, what exactly are you talking about, and this is what do you believe? That's that doesn't mean you excuse bad behavior or sinful behavior. Certainly, as Christians, you don't want to do that, but I think you want to 
you want to ask questions because I think asking questions and seeking answers is a great way to have a discussion rather than an argument. So uh, like you said, you uh, you maybe want to say, well, I want to convince this person that this program, this law is wrong or isn't the best way to get it done. Okay, you can do that in a God-pleasing way it, it, without being a jerk. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, what happens is sometimes people get pretty heated, they get very emotional, then they get keyboard courage, and then they say things that they probably would have never said, especially if they're not using their name and no one knows who you are. You're just going ahead. Now, if you're on Facebook, they're going to know who you are, but or, or uh, in some cases, others, other platforms. But for the most part, I'd just be careful. Don't, you know, don't get to name calling liar. You know, mm -hmm. you're not patriotic, or I'm yeah. more patriotic than you. You got to be really careful with that. And it's easy to do. It is really easy to do just because what you're trying to do is you want to earn the right to be heard to share good news with them. And that's not who you're voting for. The good news <laughs> is who died for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> your ultimate goal is not to win the person for president for your presidential candidate, but to share the king of kings, right? And I, right. I think right. I've, I've had to navigate those waters too. And, um, you know, you and I share that affinity for keeping up on current events and politics and stuff going on around the world. And I try as a, as a personal litmus, I try to stay out of as much as I can stay out of conversations about policies and politics, recognizing that there are different worldviews, there are different ways of coming to the same, you know, approaching the same problem, um, different yeah, answers. To and, and I'm okay with the, the diversity, even among the body of Christ. But when somebody posts about, and like you said, you know, the, the right to life, when somebody posts something that minimizes that life or somehow they, they're attacking one of God's, you know, sexuality is another one, one of God's intended blessings and trying to manipulate it or change it or denigrate it in some way. That's kind of when I, I feel the responsibility to step in and like you said, respectfully, but present, here's why, you know, uh, for some of the people that I have uh, on both sides, I'm one of the few people that they are, have on their Facebook friend list that doesn't necessarily agree with them on everything. So they've, they're in this echo chamber. So I sometimes get an opportunity to talk about, well, here's why the Bible says what it does about taking care of creation or why it says about the the life, the value of life, um, and, and try to kind of use that as a platform to get to why why I, God is worth listening to on this topic. Yeah, what makes these waters difficult to navigate, probably more so today than it was even a, a decade or a generation ago, is, as we said before, a lot of people have their own truth and their real truth is all based on emotion. And so uh, if you make them feel bad, somehow you have done something wrong. And you've also got the whole idea that um, acceptance equals affirmation. And that's not true. I can accept you as a human being, as a brother or sister in Christ, or uh, just as, you know, uh, my neighbor. That doesn't mean I affirm all of your choices or your beliefs if they aren't in line with Scripture. So, but what happens today is people say, no, no, they've, for practical purposes, said, no, acceptance equals affirmation. And that's something people don't understand. That's an underlying problem and belief in our culture right now. And that can cause a lot of problems when you're talking in politics. Well, you're, you know, I disagree with you on that. Well, you're bigoted. You're a homophobe. You're xenophobic. Uh, name it. It's a phobia of something. I always wonder why Christians don't go, are you, are you like Christophobe or what if that's a word? <laughs> But, you know, it's, I, I, again, no, I, I respect you. I think your life matters, certainly to God, matters to me. And uh, I happen to disagree with you. That doesn't, then that's the idea that today almost you can't disagree with people because then they become easily offended. And that's like the greatest sin, if there is mm -hmm. a sin in some people's minds. Yeah. So, but you understand, think, that's, that's key. I think that's a, to me, I see that as a byproduct of people uh, cocooning themselves in their echo chambers, not actually yeah. engaging with people. And I think that's that has to first happen in person. So you have to you have to get coffee with or have your friend over who disagrees with you on faith. And too many Christians don't know another Christian. Too many Republicans don't know a Democrat. Too many Democrats don't know. So you got to you have to practice that skill of 
of accepting and loving a person, even if you disagree with them on one particular point. Uh, that that's a really really valuable thing, and that that applies too to witnessing. Because if you come across sharing your faith as someone who is wagging your finger from on top of your your high horse, you're you're not witnessing the way Jesus called us to witness. Um, you have to get down into into the trenches with somebody and show that acceptance. Like you said, don't tell me what a friend I have in Jesus until I you, I know what a friend I have in you. If you're not doing that you're not, your, your witness is, is compromised. And, you know, when we talk about it's, you know, people talk about, I want to get the right person in office, whether that's a doctor or a law, you know, a, a doctor, a mayor or a governor or a senator or the president, you know, and, and what perspective do we as Christians have in that? I, one of the things they've always talked about is <laughs> Romans 13 is a tough passage for people who are Jesus followers sometimes to read because it talks about God uses the officials mm-hmm. that he ultimately allows to be there to be his servants to bring you good. That's always kind of a hard pa- passage because I'm a little older than you and I've seen a lot of presidents and some I've really liked and others I have, I had to respect the office, but I didn't like what they stood for, what they did, what they passed, what they uh, talked about and so on. And yet Romans 13 always came back as a pastor. You're always talking about it every other year, just about you're like, ah, oh, they're God's yeah. servants. You're like, oh, no, that can't be God's servant. Then you go back and you think, well, listen, there are no perfect presidents. Just use presidents, okay? You go back into their lives. My first president, I don't rem- I remember him very briefly, uh, was Kennedy. Well, everyone loved Kennedy, thought he was the greatest president. Now, years later, you realize, not such a good guy. Not mm-hmm. always such a good guy, you know, personally, at all, yeah. morally, at all, right? I mean, other people, they hated Nixon, although Nixon did a lot of great things with work with uh, foreign nations at that time, China. Yeah. Yet they're not perfect people. And, you know, you got the others. You've got Bush Sr. and you got the Clintons. And then you've got uh, the Obamas. And then you got Bush Jr., you know. And now you've got um, Trump. And, you know, th- there are no perfect people at all. Yeah. And yet God uses those people to accomplish ultimately what he wants to have done in the big picture, but that's a hard thing. Uh, you know, my thing is again, that whole idea of um, post-millennialism, this idea that if we could just get the right laws, the right people in there, then, mm-hmm. you know, sin will stop, or at least it'll decrease greatly. And then you can have, you know, heaven on earth, so to speak. Uh, evil will be reduced. You know, that whole post millennium a millennialistic uh, view of eschatology of the end times where that's where you get a lot of social justice out of it. That comes out of that. Uh, currently a better world. You know, I just, I, I, that I always think in the underlying background, that's what you see a lot of times. People just think we can get the right laws, pass the right legislation. And, and remember law doesn't change people's hearts. Right. It might act as a curb to keep them on the right path from hurting themselves and others. It doesn't change people's hearts. And so to legislate, I don't know, the kingdom of God on this earth is never going to happen, of course. And to legislate truth into people's hearts doesn't happen either. You brought up a That doesn't mean you vote for your favorite president or senator yeah. or something like that. But realize you're not voting for a perfect person. I'm not, as I said years ago, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not voting in a, uh, a pastor in chief. I'm voting <laughs> in a commander in chief. And I think you brought up a really key passage at Romans 13 section where it says, submit to the governing authorities. Jesus said the same thing, right, to Pilate. You would have no authority except that which God gave you. Um, I I found those really fascinating passages to dig into um, when I lived in China. Um, Where I lived was where Mao Zedong 50 years earlier had sent all the dissidents into work camps. And so a lot of people I was working with, um, their parents, grandparents, friends of their grandparents were uh, out out in that part of China in work slave camps. Um, and and so there was no love for the Communist Party around where I lived, at least the people that I got to talk to. And to be able to dig into Romans 13 and say, God calls you to submit. I know you have no voice in who is the government. I know you have no no say. You don't get to vote, right? Uh, at that point, it was Hu Jintao, now it's Xi Jinping. Um, you don't get to vote, and yet God still calls you to submit. 
um, to honor and respect, to recognize that this is authority that God has established, not to go along with sin, not to condone sin, but to honor them as though um, God was standing right behind them. And, and through honoring them, you're honoring God. I mean, ultimately, that's the fourth commandment. Um, God, honor your father and mother. Uh, we as Lutherans know, we talk about how that applies to any in authority. It's your parents, your teacher, your boss, governing authorities. We honor them because through that, we honor God. I sense a resurgence uh, among young people, Gen Z and, and young millennials, um, and their interest in politics. Things like Turning Point USA, the Young Turks, uh, those are kind of on opposite sides of the spectrum, really work hard to appeal to and recruit young minds to their worldview. But I think a lot of young people are very cynical of government. We watch the world burn in, at 9-11, those who are alive at that point. We kind of feel like the rich got richer and politicians helped them in the crash of 07 and 08. Uh, we saw the most anticipated, anticipated presidency of the last 100 years end up as same, more of the same partisan bickering and deadlock. We're watching as Washington turns on itself in the middle of a global crisis of COVID. Are we right to be cynical? Well, I, I think it's understandable that many are cynical. Um, from my vantage point, I would think, what do you expect from sinful people in a sinful world? This isn't the first time, and it's yeah. not going to be the last. You know, I guess what's come more to the forefront for me is there will, uh, you know, scholars will tell you there's really four chief idols that we chase as human beings, and you especially see all four of these in politics, and that does make people cynical because it seems like you're constantly chasing these and you need to do all of these just to get to a position, it appears today. But, you know, there's money. There's always people want money. It always takes yeah. money. I mean, I, I'm always amazed that, and, and I can understand people going, why do I get in politics? First of all, I'm not rich enough. It's for millionaires and billionaires. Then the next one is power. Everyone likes power, and these people like, we're seeing that right now as, we have some concerns um, as American citizens if maybe some governors have gone too far with the power that somehow they've been granted or at least are using right now during the whole safer at home time right now. So you've got money, you've got power, those two idols that all of us fight against. you got pleasure, right? Pleasure. I want what's mine. Uh, in fact, it's the, you know, kind of the new thing that makes my life better it's pleasure if i as long as i'm happy then whatever makes me happy must be good kind of thing and then you got fame i mean what else you got you got people doing all sorts of crazy things on youtube just to get their moment of fame no, and no. uh so, uh, all four of those things i think appear in politics and yeah you can get pretty cynical about all of that stuff money power pleasure and fame yeah i get it but that doesn't mean you don't continue to work you got it you got to work Oftentimes, um, you know, I, God still doesn't say, oh, yeah, because life isn't perfect, that's all right. You can just complain a lot and not do anything. I heard somebody kind of talking about cynicism recently. I forget where this was, but they talked about stage one is naivete, where you just think <laughs> everybody's good, no experience otherwise, and, and uh, you implicitly trust. and. After that gets turned a couple of times and that trust gets let down, you get betrayed, then it turns to cynicism. Uh, that's a pretty natural progression to, you know, nobody's trustworthy. Nobody can do what they say. It's not worth, I'm just yeah, going to back away, disengage. Um, but I think for what you're talking about is to take the next step, which is not natural. It's to engage even though, even with the expectation that you're going to be let down and betrayed, and yet you're still going to be generous, you're still going to be um, in yeah. intentional, and you're still going to take steps graciously, knowing that a president's going to let you down, a governor's going to let you down. Uh, they are sinful human yeah. beings, as you say. Um, but it, it's not enough just to stay cynical. Yeah, I'm going to follow Jesus' example, obviously, who, talk about cynical, he's training his disciples and then when he needs them, they all run. And then after he rises from the dead, they go, are you setting up the kingdom now? And he's like, uh, you know, really, you guys still don't get it, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you're right. It just, it just reminds me we have more work to do. And we have this great truth and this power that's more powerful than anything. And that's the Holy Spirit living in us. So we're, we're well equipped. Yeah. Uh, John, how, you know, th this is a really divisive time, I think. Uh, I think it's fair to say that we're as polarized as ever. 
um, as a nation, as a culture, if not more polarized, maybe we are more polarized, I don't know, help uh, Christians remain united with each other, even if they differ on politics. I think about even my family, we have vastly different views in the political world. Um, and I don't want our family to be divided by that. I, I want to be united by our Christian faith. So help, help kind of give some tips or some ideas on how to keep priorities, priorities, and to be able to differ without letting that divide. Well, you're right. That that can be a problem, especially among families. You know, I got a 31-year-old son and a 28-year-old son who um, would argue politics with me in certain areas that we don't agree with, and yet they're my sons. I love them, and they're Christians, and they love Jesus. That's good. But you're right. This That's important. I, I would say this, again, um, make sure you, maybe you're talking about you're trying to get something done. Um, it's a goal that you both have. You just have different ways of seeing the government help reach that goal. It's the methodology. You mentioned this before, Ben, that it's the idea of, okay, we both want the, this to be better. How do we best help, let's say, the poor without taking away personal responsibility? Without taking away, you know, there, there are some parameters you have to work within because you don't want people just to realize, I, I could just sit here and get money all of my life because that doesn't do them or the people around them any good. And that's really not a loving thing to do for someone. To help people who are truly poor and help them get out of poverty, yeah, that's great. But that doesn't mean you give them everything. I'll just use that as an example. So you can go about and say, yes, we want to help the poor. Well, how's the best way to do that? You can have different methodologies. Uh, and depending on where, what country you're in as well and what time in this country you are. I always ask those three questions that we ask, we tell everyone to ask, and that's, okay, what do you mean by that, right? Um, how did you come to that conclusion? Why do you think that's the best way? And like so many times in politics, most people go, well, that's what the person I'm in favor of says. Okay, that's great. Why does she say that? Why does he say that? And then the third thing is, then you can say, well, okay, here's my vantage point. Here's why I think there's a better way to handle education to handle uh, helping the environment to handle helping the poor or the homeless so I, I think you have to go about that and be a good listener a lot of times we're not good listeners at least i'm not a good listener and i always want to jump in and go yeah but what about this and that never goes well yeah 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 i think that listening is key because especially in the political world i think but this happens too in faith Somebody starts a sentence and you've heard somebody else start the same sentence and you automatically assume you know how the sentence is going to end or how they got to that. And then you start you start attacking really a straw man and not listening to the individual. Um, it's sure. helped me. My, um, I've got two brothers and so we, we, we disagree on some things and it's when a text message stream starts to get heated, I've had to force myself to kind of stop before I respond, pray. We got to call my temper, call my, you know, whatever. I'm speaking out of fear here. Or I'm speaking out of anxiousness or whatever. Um, help me to, to prioritize what's really important. I mean, the fact that it's my brother is more important than whether or not we agree or disagree on topic A or topic B. Um, and uh, I, I've had, I think it really starts with me. And I think I hear you saying that too. Um, if my political discussions get heated and antagonistic, I need to take the first step in in um, doing what I have to do to to have disagreement without getting into um, without being you know, disagreeable. Yeah, right. There you go. That's a good way of saying it, John. It is a yeah, huge guess. topic. We can talk about a lot of different kind of going different directions. Um, we'll save that for a different podcast. You got anything you want to kind of button up, button this up with, or or share as a last word? I think when you're talking about politics, though, one of the things we need to know, and, and in my age group growing up, we had something called uh, government class, right? I don't know. A lot of people know a lot about their own government. And so one of the problems we have in politics is a lot of people don't know how they work. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I ask people, okay, what are the freedoms given you in the First Amendment? They can't mm -hmm. name all five. Now, I'm not going to put you on the spot. <laughs> but if Anthony was on there, I'd put him on the spot. But I mean, one of them that I really struggle with right now, I know you might maybe know this too, is the freedom 
of religion in the sense of, you, you know, the, I got a, I got a clause right here. It says the establish um, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. I think we need to revisit that right now in the middle of this pandemic. And the trouble with the Christian church right now in its politics is you want to make sure you give people what they need most, and that's food for their soul and the peace of knowing Jesus is in control ultimately. At the same time, you want to love your neighbor and, and not be known as a church. Hey, we're the church that opened up and made mm -hmm. everyone else sick. So we're, we're, we're in that that area so big thing i would encourage christians to do is first of all know what you're talking about from mm -hmm. a standpoint of our government and how it works i don't see a lot of younger people really understand the three branches of government and and the bill of rights and what that all means and i wonder sometimes if our politicians do so biggest thing i would encourage you to do is have nice discussions with people Keep yourself educated and keep your uh, public officials, local, state, and federal, in your prayers. That's a command yeah, from God, and yeah. that's a good way to end. Yeah, good. Well, thanks for kind of leading us through this, John. It's good for all of us to kind of take a fresh perspective about our assumptions uh, and really build our worldview from our faith to our politics, not from our politics to our faith. Uh, hope that our listeners, hope you guys got um, some things to think about. Did you hear something that resonated with you? Was there a fresh perspective that kind of helped you think through something? Be sure to share your thoughts in our brand new Facebook discussion group. Uh, we launched that kind of with our year celebration, one year anniversary celebration and 12,000 downloads. Uh, it's our Facebook discussion group. If you're not in that yet, you can find that. Um, you can link to that. You there's a link to it from our Facebook page. Uh, you'll also find um, our Instagram account. We'd love to hear from you. Love to hear your thoughts on the topic. And uh, we'll we'll continue to. This is this is a topic that I think there's no no time when anybody really nails it and gets it right and then stays on the right path. So we keep kind of fighting with this, keep wrestling with it, um, keep taking it to the Lord in prayer to to help us have wisdom in these discussions. Um, and hopefully this conversation on when fear reigns has helped you navigate that and uh, help the fear of the Lord to reign in your life. We'll see you next time.